You're watching MPS Connections with AJ Hoffman. There we started. Sure Five. did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to MPS Connections. I'm your host, AJ Hoffman. I'm joined today by Chief Nicole Ford from the Midland Police Department and Lieutenant Jai Mahavir. I, I spelled it, I pronounced it right still? So Perfect. Let's see if we, we continue that throughout the, the show. <laughs> uh, we were chatting just a little bit before. Uh, you guys, can you guys give me a little bit about uh, your background just to kind of start off with? Chief Ford, you want to start? So I have been chief in the city of Midland for two and a half years, which means I came in literally months before a flood, a pandemic and social injustice marches. So, um, but prior to that, I spent most of my career in Southeast Michigan area. Um, I've been in law enforcement for 25 years. I've had, I've held every rank from officer through chief. So, um, just happy to be here in Midland. Uh, it's a great community. What, what brought you to Midland? The chief's job. The chief's job. <laughs> yeah, I was actually um, advised that they were hiring a chief and um, I liked the community and heard a lot of great things, and so I came out and applied, and here we are. That's awesome. What about you, Lieutenant? Yeah, I'm originally from the Detroit area. Went to school at CMU. Was blessed to uh, start my uh, profession here with Midland. Uh, it's been 20 years. In the course of that, I've been patrol, school resource officer for seven years, and sergeant. And now I'm the patrol lieutenant and SWAT commander for the department. Nice. Fire up chips. There you sure. go. We're, we're on a roll. We're getting more Chippewas in here versus uh, SVSU Cardinals. So yeah, awesome. the, the Eastern Eagles were still pretty slim, I got to say. I don't, I don't see a lot with my matching license plate out here. It's, it's a rarity. Right? It is. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're here, of course, to talk about school safety. Could you guys tell me about some of the strongest supports we have in place in our buildings? Well, I think our, our absolute first line of defense are our school resource officers. We're extremely fortunate here in the city of Midland to be able to have four. Um, most cities are lucky if they get to have one. So the fact that we have them in four different main schools and then they also trickle down into the elementary schools is a resource that uh, we are extremely lucky to have here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got stopped by one the other day. I was telling you I, I'm like brand new to the job. So, and my badge, they changed the, the um, access on my badge, so I can't get in, I can only get in through the front door, right? <laughs> when I was a service tech, I could get in any door, which was awesome, you know, but uh, now I'm just a marketing guy, so they, they changed my, so anyways, I was at Northeast the other day, and went out the back, because I saw kids playing on the playground and stuff, and uh, SRO came <laughs> marching over, he's like, who is this guy taking pictures of our kids and stuff? I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This is why we're having you guys on the show, you know? So as I just told him thank you and everything. And then, like, I'm going to go back inside now, and then I forgot that my badge doesn't work in the back. <laughs> so I look super shady going in. And was, yeah. So you guys are, are doing fantastic. Uh, what is, is, is there something that you guys wish that parents or, or the community um, – knew more about as far as school safety goes? You know, it's school safety is kind of a tricky thing because we want parents to be aware that we are very actively training on it, but we also don't want to scare them because we're very actively training on it. So it's really a fine line. Um, what I can say is, again, we're extremely fortunate here to have the resources and the relationships that we have because uh, Lieutenant Mahabir and I meet with administration here monthly with Midland Public Schools. We meet with our county partners and our emergency manager monthly for school events. Um, you know, that's extremely uncommon in cities. A lot of times nobody thinks to talk to each other until there's a major event, which is a terrible plan. Um, yeah. Our SWAT team, you know, Lieutenant Mahabir can obviously speak more to that, but they train regularly for events, so um, we're really lucky that way. Right, if you were actually do like a uh, pecking order or a chart, schools definitely are our highest end. Um, that is priority. You know, not only being invested in this community myself, with my children attending these schools, we understand as law enforcement the importance of keeping our kids safe and creating an environment that makes not only the children safe, but makes the parents comfortable. Yeah. Huge. 
huge. Um, Lieutenant, how many kids do you have here? I have three that have gone. Okay. One, one's graduated, but I have two still in the school systems. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. How about you, Chief? I'm older than Lieutenant Mahavier, <laughs> and mine are all adults. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, and school safety is a broad term. I understand. So, you know, correct me if, if um, I'm out of line with anything or, or uh, just reeling it back in. What? What? Uh, but what are, are some of the other threats aside from? And you corrected me earlier uh, from an active assailant situation or an active assailant crisis in the buildings. What are some other threats that that you guys are constantly kind of looking out for in the buildings? You know, we try to plan for everything that we can. So, you know, weather events. Midland, we, we got a really great practice when I when I got here. I often tease my bosses that you guys really go above and beyond to make sure that I can make the grade and, and gave me a 500-year flood event. So, um, yeah. you know, we, we get to work with our emergency operations center regularly, our uh, county emergency manager, our county partners actually live in the same building with us. So. Um, we get to train together for any type of event and then of course you know the everyday stuff we are watching our trends with uh, drugs that are in schools and substances that are being used within schools and um, you know TikTok trends that encourage kids to do not always the brightest things yeah. you know so we try to stay on top of all of that and that's the advantage to us having layers you know where we have people in the school and then we have supervision that oversees those officers to try to work as checks and balances to make sure we're hitting everything. The TikTok trends are something I never even thought <laughs> of, but yeah, you're you're right. I mean, it seems like, you know, there's a small percentage, but even so, there's something that, that there's some new dangerous trend that's coming up on on you know TikTok that they the kids all kind of jump on, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now on a broader scope kind of on, a, on the national scale, what are some of the things you think we can learn from, from the tragedies that have happened kind of continuously each year around the country? You know, that's kind of a, a double-edged sword, isn't it? You know, yeah. the un, an unfortunate part is we have those opportunities to learn from. Um, the part that I am proud of is we take those as opportunities to learn from them instead of just going, well, we're good, it didn't happen here. Right. And I think that's how we stay relevant and effective and so, in fact, uh, immediately after Uvalde, uh, Lieutenant Mahabir and I met and, and laid out some expectations and how we would handle things and um, what our theory is behind um, entry versus non-entry, that kind of stuff, so that we are not making that decision the first time on the worst day in our city. Right, absolutely. And That's fair. I mean, yeah, it's a learning process. Uh, in itself and Chief Ford with our communication. Obviously, it's uh, every day is different and every incident can be different, but we do have a plan in place and uh, I'm very confident in our officers and our and what, how we would respond to those type of uh, active assailants, if you will. Absolutely. In a crisis situation, is there something school staff should be focusing on? Their students. You 100%. Know, um, that's, that's their first priority. Our job is to to handle the threat. Their job is to make sure that, that they can do everything they can to keep their students safe. Um, and I think that's the important part going in is recognizing that we all have different jobs and just figuring out how we intertwine them to do it the best we can do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, cool. As far as technology goes, we have a lot of technology and a lot of systems in, in the buildings. And I know you kind of told me, you know, through email that that, that was kind of a system that, um, Maybe I'm wrong that you guys are kind of separated from, but like the Raptor system, and uh, we're we're talking about getting some other systems in place mm -hmm. as well. How do you guys interact with with some of that new technology in the buildings? Um, I would say with having our SROs in the building, they immediately have access through administration. We just don't necessarily have first user access. Um, we have been invited to. Um, check out different products that the schools are looking to be brought in and be partners in those discussions. So I think that speaks to the type of relationship that we have, that they're, when they're looking at making building changes, they're reaching out to our office to see if there's something they could do that would make them safer. Um, when they're looking at different technologies, because there's all kinds of them out there now, there's you know zero eyes and 
uh, evolve with that the other one that we just saw recently. Um, the fact that the school invites us in to be a part of that really speaks to the partnership, and, yeah. and I don't know an, another area that gets that kind of opportunity. I know, and it speaks volumes on MPS's half, behalf, and the uh, yeah, Chief's right. The SROs are a foothold for us. Uh, they're the voice for us to make sure the right hand is talking to the left hand because we have so much technology on our end, we want to make sure they blend. And again, that relationship's huge. I don't know if it would be there if we didn't have SROs. Yeah. At least not as clear. Yeah. So, Is there a system you guys would recommend, one over another, or, or one that you, you kind of work more closely with? Um, or even in past districts or, you know, that you guys have come from? So I have had the uh, unique opportunity to get to police in over six different counties, the way that my jobs have overlapped. So, um, and school technology wasn't really rolling out then. We're just now really kind of starting to see it catch up. Um, so we have recently looked at two programs and in my absolute ideal world, they would use both of them. And so one of them is a uh, security surveillance that helps do early detection of weapons and threats and whatnot, and then also the uh, detectors at the doors. Um, that would be our ideal world. And fortunately, they're making them now where they don't look like, you know, you're setting up our kids in prison because that's always a, a careful balance. We don't want to, we feel like we're, you know, sending our kids to imprisonment each day right. and we want them to feel safe and comfortable. So I like now that we're starting to see the products that they are recognizing that it, it can't look like that. So um, we're just going to kind of hang on and see what the school district does. But we're very excited that they're looking at them and that they invite us to take a look at them also. Yeah. Are there some things that you could you could talk to students about that would make them feel more comfortable about around the SROs or or just police on the streets in general? Yeah, that's a tough question. But for the most part, it really isn't due to the fact that the SROs that are in there. Because even for parents, we're in, and most times when you look at police officers, you're looking at either consequences of either fines, citations, or even jail. With our school resource officers, their number one responsibility is to build that relationship. Um, you know, all too often we have kids, unfortunately, come from broken homes or they have different things going on outside that maybe affect their learning and just expect their everyday world. For them to have the resource of a school resource officer and being approachable that like they are, because we do, we, we, too, we take that very seriously when it comes to choosing who our school resources are. Uh, the one thing for matter, I'm, I'm jumping all over, so I apologize, but for the most part, it takes a special police officer to do that. Not every police officer wants to be a school resource officer. We recognize that is a, that are, is a staple amongst the patrol and the school resource officers as a whole is the fact that we're there for the community. We're not there to get people in trouble. We're there to help them and be a resource for them, obviously. Like any good kid, sometimes good kids make poor choices. And yes, sometimes we're there at that end as well. But for the most part, we are there as a resource and obviously continue to build relationships. That's what we love to do. And that's who we are. Because um, as you can imagine, the blessings that we have are the fact that we do have school, school resource officers uh, at the lower levels. And then we have school resource officers at our secondary ed, with our high schools. Um, that relationship continues. And so we don't lose connection. You know, back in the day, you know, we used to talk about the D.A.R.E. classes or the classes that we spoke and how effective they were and hard to measure. Some people, you know, they argued that. That's a fair argument. But now, D.A.R.E. classes, if you scratch the curriculum, you have, the fact that you have an officer in there with students and you have that relationship and then they're there in the school with those kids, I, I don't know how you can measure that. That's, that's, that goes so far. And not only that, as they go through their adolescent years and the seventh and eighth grade, where that's huge in child development, we all know that. And then there's another officer at the high school level who shares that same common interest, and that's keeping those kids safe and feeling safe. And like you said, Aaron, earlier in the podcast, social media brings a whole different level to school nice. resource officer and responsibilities therein. Because I try to be a good parent. I know Chief tries to be a good parent. But man, cell phones, social media outlets, there's so much out there that we just don't know. Right, so. right. Well, I, I'm, you touched on something that I absolutely love, like uh, 
the intangibles of uh, measurable qualities. How do you measure if if someone's doing a good job or not? How do you? Me I mean, it's the same thing with teachers. How do you measure that they're really doing a great job and being a great teacher, other than showing up to work every day? How do you measure that an SRO off? How do you measure that an SRO officer is doing a great job, or the, that the police on the streets are doing a great job? Especially in like an active assailant situation, I, I don't need to harp on that or go back to it. Um, but in those situations, you don't know if the school did a good job until after the crisis. And even then, it's unfair because it's you can never predict that. You can never ever predict something like that happening. And the school looks bad either way, and the police force looks bad either way. There's just like no winning in that situation. That is definitely a challenge, and that's as we're making decisions on responses. Um, we're big believers that you know poor planning equals terrible performance. We'll leave it in the cleaner version. Right. Um, so we try to dole out the scenarios both directions to see, recognizing the fact that um, there's no way anybody, the school system, our police department, is going to get it 100% right by everybody's standard. That's just the reality of the work that both of us do, and um, we just, all we can do is do the best for our students and our teachers, and so that parents feel safe sending their kids here, because as a parent that had had school-age children, and having a major event across the country and then having to send them back the next day, it's torturous right. because schools are supposed to be safe. And when we were growing up, they were. We, we never thought about this. Yeah. And so um, our goal is to train for every event so that our parents know that their kids are safe and then Lord forbid the worst day happens, that we know how to handle it. Right. And that's all we can do. You kind of turn into peace of mind officers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Truth. And it's hard because we do, we want people to know that we're training, but then we're also limited as to what information we can put out for obvious reasons. So um, it's kind of a balance, but the fact that we have this amazing relationship with our schools and the fact that our officers are commonplace, like they don't even, pe students don't even bat an eye when they see the officers walk down the hall, they give them a high five. Yeah. And to go back to something you said earlier, that's how we measure if an SRO is doing a good job. We watch the relationships they're building. We watch that when they're out doing an event, that students come up to them because they're like, hey, that's my school car. I recognize it, that's the Jefferson car. And oh, look at there's Officer Gattrell. And you know, we, that's how we measure. And then their um, supervisor also reaches into the district and speaks to teachers and administration and gets feedback on that. Because if we do have an officer that's not um, quite accomplishing the goals that we want, we will remove that officer. We yeah. want our best officer for this job in that school. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I, I, for as long as I remember, and I'm an MPS product as well, for as long as I can remember, there's there's been an SRO in our buildings, you know? And so they've always just seemed commonplace to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been to other districts where they didn't have an SRO, and it's, it's the most foreign concept in the world to me. I like. They celebrated the fact that when they finally did get an SRO on their buildings, they're like, you should have had one years ago. Absolutely. You know? And so we are so far ahead of that curve because we've gotten to have those years and years right. of relationship building. And, yeah. and with that, you know, students feel very comfortable coming up to our officers and saying if they hear something that's alarming to them. And that's one of our biggest things is, you know, it's just like any other... Um, community watch programs we need the community involved so if a parent hears something they need to feel comfortable reaching out if a student hears something and that's part of the reason why Midland PD works so hard to make sure that not only do we work in this community that we are actual community members as a whole right. absolutely no and I just want to add too I mean obviously uh, the comfort of having parents send kids to school our officers are also sharing information with the school administration. We're training them at how to respond to some of these uh, critical incidents. Um, and, that's, and that's the common trends, the new trends are always constantly being shared. And um, you know, the benefit of that is huge as far as uh, sharing that with their, their teams and, and making sure everybody's on the same page. Absolutely. 
from a day to day standpoint, from a day to day standpoint, what are some of the things that are that you're most commonly dealing with in the schools, or that your SO, SRO officers are dealing with in the schools? You, you list off drugs, school fights, you know, violence, um, crazy TikTok challenges, trauma from home. There's all kinds of stuff. Well, what do they find themselves most commonly dealing with? I think the most common thing that they deal with is obviously has to do with social media. Um, either, either, either for making poor choices or statements on social media, posting pictures they shouldn't be, um, and that that encompasses so much because it could be threats, pictures, um, statements. Uh, just any interpretation that creates a disturbance amongst the school creates a problem. Right. Yeah. Well, that just becomes a thing. It, young people growing up and, and learning how to become people, right? Right. You know, <laughs> effective people in society. Or sure. effective. Good citizens. Good citizens. Just trying to be a good citizen. Yeah. It, it takes a while to get there, but... Well, you know. and, and to our kids' defense, they have a lot more hurdles to that than we did, you know? If we had somebody that was picking on us in school, we got to go home and it was we were away from that. Now they have 24-7 access to each yeah. other and a far greater network as to where do they can spread rumors and, and such. And um, with that comes a lot more of learning how to navigate that and deal with relationships and whatnot that we just didn't have to address when we were kids. I never thought about it that way, but yeah, you, you just can't turn it off anymore. No, can't turn it off. you don't have that... That, I hate these words, that safe space. You know, home used to right. be safe. You know, you got a break from it, and, and now they don't necessarily because there's the phone. Yeah, yeah, when I was growing up, you'd go home and you reset for the night, and then it's a brand new day tomorrow. You yeah, be geared up to go back and do yeah, it again. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> or you might become friends with the kid the next day. Mm -hmm. Sure. But with social media, it's always going, you know. Yeah, right. you're right, there, that's a huge challenge we, we don't think of. Is there anything else you guys would like to add? I would like to, you know, really encourage the parents. Uh, you know, we are all busy. Everyone, you know, very few homes anymore get to have one parent stay home all the time. Um, most most homes are, are having two parents work just to make ends meet and, and to afford all that we need to afford these days. But make sure we're taking time to ask questions, you know, ask who the important people are in our kids' lives. Um, just know basics because that's, that's one more check and balance for your kids to know that you're paying attention. Um, and kids need that regardless of what they might tell you. They need that structure and that reassurance that, that you're there and, and you're paying attention and you care. Um, and it really helps us too, you know. It's, it's challenging when you're like, I, I don't, we deal with a kid and we're asking the parents, well, you know, where do you think he might have gone to? And they're like, I actually don't know. I don't know any of their names. I don't know where any of them live. Um, yeah. And again, because of the access through the phone and social media, they have friends all over now. So it's really important. I mean, my, my youngest is turning 19 this month, and I dropped him at a friend's house. I'm like, and what's his first and last name again? And, and I programmed his address into my phone um, because if something happens, I at least need to know where to look for him, you know? and. Uh, because they have such further reach now, we just we have to be a little more diligent on that end. What about you, Lieutenant Mahogany? Oh, man. Do we have enough time for this? <laughs> so, we have uh, all the time in the world. I think the biggest thing from a parent standpoint is to listen. Listen. You don't have to talk always, but just to listen, to be there for kids. As a school resource officer for seven years, I will tell you, some of the most successful kids that came through the buildings that I was at, they always had one common factor, and the common factor was they always had that one person, whether it was a parent, cousin, uncle, somebody in their life that was stable and held them accountable. Even though at times they may have hated them for it, they always reflect back on that, and that was some of the reasons why they were so successful. And uh, they were able to listen to that was a big one um, just being there being present in the moment so I know life gets busy at times trust me I get it but for the most part if you're just there for a few minutes a day that goes that pays I mean can't put a measurement on that either so mm -hmm. that's huge right. 
Lieutenant Mojave here, Chief Ford. Thank you both for being on the show. I know you guys are busy, so I really appreciate you both making the time and, and uh, being on the show. So Absolutely. There's no place we'd rather be. Thank you for having us. That's awesome. Agreed. I might have you on the show again some other time. If that, if now that I know it's not so scary, I'll come back. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in. It's pretty easy, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, AJ. You're welcome. Thank you. This is AJ Hoffman from MPS Connections signing off. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of MPS Connections. We release new content on the first and third Thursday of almost every month. Do you have an idea for a podcast or other content from the district? Send it to communications at midlandps.org. Thanks.